first, I just want to say that um, I think that the, all the speakers, those who are still here and those who weren't here, did a splendid job. And there's, I think there's very little that I need to add. And that's fine, because my intention was always just to somehow maybe <coughs> summarize what was done, give some perspective, maybe emphasize some points which might not have been emphasized. But I think a lot has been emphasized. And I think there's really not that much I need to do. Um, anyway, here are what I take to be some of the most interesting and important things about foundations of quantum mechanics or even issues more broadly understood that Bell contributed to. to. It wasn't just non-locality that he discovered. He played such an important role in finding mm. crucial issues, crucial questions. So I'll begin with by just what I intend to do about each of these uh, topics here is just give you a few characteristic quotations from Bell. Um, and if I get through the bottom here and I still have some time, I will come to part two of my talk. <laughs> I don't know how much time this will take. I mean, I will say very little about non-locality because, frankly, so much has been said already. There's, there's no need to say more. So these first two items here, hidden variables and non-locality, that I am putting them in that order simply because that seemed to be the logical order of Bell's work. But he first considered the question of hidden variables, and that led him to the issue of non-locality. Then the next three items here, and then this one, the fifth, fifth one or sixth, whatever number it is, these things are connected in a rather mm, serious, logical way, and I'll, I'll try to explain that a little bit. Let me explain the color code. Many of you know the color code. Red is bad. Blue is good. Now, for the students, why is that, why is hidden red? Because what? It tells me nothing. It's, it's not clear really what, what does it mean hidden from who, from, from who hidden. And Anybody else? <laughs> Students? Because you cannot control it. OK, so any case, you will see. Bell, I think I, will ha I have some quote where Bell says he doesn't li like that word to talk about hidden variables, and he thinks it's really silly terminology. People have talked about another, this other bad thing here, naive realism about operators, but you just heard about that. But I don't think this terminology has been used. OK, let's begin with hidden variables. No, let me begin actually with something which not, is not even on the list, but really played an important role with, with, with Bell's thinking. And this has been stressed by several of the speakers. I mean, you know. People who are, would like to find a, either a hidden variable theory, using the bad terminology, or a realistic understanding of quantum mechanics, they're often criticized by wanting to return to classical physics. And in fact, in fact, the real motivation is a demand for clarity and precision. Now, some people may identify clarity and precision with classical physics, if that's what you mean by classical physics, and I'm all for cla class of classical physics. Here's, a, here's Bell's first Bell quote. Conventional formulations of quantum theory, and of quantum field theory in particular, are unprofessionally vague and ambiguous. Professor, professional theoretical physicists ought to be able to do better. Bohm has shown us a way. Now, the hidden variables. Yes? I guess hidden is a bad word because uh, actually in quantum mechanics, position of the particles is the only parameter that determines the outcomes of the measurement. So it's the only uh, physical quantity that we in quantum mechanics we can measure. It's even more than that, but you're right. Okay. The realization that by Neumann's proof, 
is of limited relevance, has been gaining ground since the 1952 work of Bohm. <clears throat> However, it is far from universal. Moreover, the writer, that is Bell, has not found in the literature any adequate analysis of what went wrong. Like all authors of non-commissioned reviews, he thinks he can restate the position with such clarity and simplicity that all previous discussions will be eclipsed. This was from his um, Hidden Variables, first Hidden Variables paper. Maybe it was the fir his first paper on foundations of quantum mechanics. And that led him to the issue of non-locality in which he said, in this, this is from the same paper, he, he, because it was a hidden variables paper, theory, paper about hidden variables, he did look at the, basically the only hidden variables theory on the table at the time, Bohm, Bohm's theory, he studied, he looked at it, saw how it fit in with um, the no hidden variables theorems, and he said, in this theory, an explicit causal mechanism exists whereby the disposition of one piece of apparatus affects the results obtained with a distant piece. This is strange, of course. Bohm, of course, was well aware of these features of his scheme and has given them much attention. However, it must be stressed that to the present writer's knowledge, there is no proof that any hidden variable account of quantum mechanics must have this extraordinary character. It would therefore be interesting, perhaps, to pursue some further impossibility proofs, replacing the arbitrary axioms objected to above by some condition of locality or of separability of distant systems. And you've ha heard an enormous amount about that, what the upshot of, that, the anal of the ensuing analysis of Bell led to. He got much more than he bargained for. He wanted to show, he wanted to see if he could show that, any, that it was, whether or not it was, he wanted to show it would be impossible to have a local hidden variables theory. And he showed it was impossible to have a local theory at all. Nature is non-local if it's governed by quantum mechanics. Now, the notion of a quantum theory without observers was crucial to Bell. The, and I, it's been explained to you by many speakers what that means. It is not, the, I, the idea here is of course not that we don't want to have observers in physics. Observers in the real world and physics better account for the fact that there are observers. But observers and measurement and vague notions like that, and not just vague, but even macroscopic notions, they just seem not to belong in the very formulation of what you would regard, could be regarded as a fundamental physical theory. So, and this is advice to you. If you see some proposal for a new interpretation of quantum mechanics, it will often be very complicated. And you will want to understand whether it's viable or not, it has much merit or not. If you see that it, it involves axioms about measurement, you can probably save yourself a lot of trouble by just saying, this just doesn't address the problem. There should be no axioms about measurement. And I have found that, by and large, physicists have enormous trouble appreciating this demand. They just can't get away from axioms about measurement, as simple as a, a demand, despite that, that it's a very simple demand. Here's Bell. The concept of measurement, bad word, becomes so fuzzy on reflection that it is quite surprising to have it appearing in physical theory at the most fundamental level. Does not any analysis of measurement require concepts more fundamental than measurement? And should not the fundamental theory be about these more fundamental concepts? Bell goes on. It would seem that the theory, quantum theory, is exclusively concerned about the results of measurement and has nothing to say about anything else. What exactly qualifies some physical systems to play the role of measurer? And here I, here I this, this, many of the quotes I'll be using here were used before. If, in fact, there's some repetition, you should take that as, uh, as a sign that um, these are really important quotes. Lots of people are using them. And be sure, all the, sure, all the more certain to 
try to un make sure you understand them. I, by the way, I don't, I don't expect that just if you haven't really studied these quotes and studied Bell, I don't expect that you're, you would instantly understand them. But what I would insist upon is that you should try to understand them and get yourself to a point where you do understand them. And that's part of why I, what I consider the value of what I'm doing here. I'm telling, you, I'm telling you that these are things you need to understand, whether you understand them entirely now or not. You will understand, you will be rewarded for the effort you make in trying to understand these things. Okay, was the wave function of the world waiting to jump for thousands of millions of years until a single cell living creature appeared? Or did it have to wait a little longer for some better qualified system with a PhD? If the theory is to apply to anything but highly idealized laboratory operations, are we not obliged to admit that more or less measurement-like processes are going on more or less all the time, more or less everywhere? I think Lev denied this at lunch today, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're not going to object now because we went, we went through it at lunch and everything's on the table. Do we, not have, do we not have jumping then all the time? Now let me make a remark about the measurement problem. Of course, Bell wrote a great paper on the measurement problem called Against Measurement. I don't have really any quotes from there, although there could be many quotes. What I, the point I want to make is want to emphasize is the connection between the measurement problem and the idea, the demand that quantum theory, that any phys fundamental physical theory, and quantum theory in particular, be a, a theory without observers. That the axioms of the theory don't refer to measurement or observation. That would say that if we try to analyze quantum theory, textbook quantum theory, all of the axioms which refer to special, special things happening during measurements should be ignored. We should only take seriously, or try to take seriously, the axioms which just refer to what's happening when, regardless of whether a measurement is taking place or not. That is Schrodinger's equation. No reference to measurement in Schrodinger's equation. Well, when you analyze what happens to the wave function of a system and apparatus during Schrodinger's equation, and don't, any, don't invoke any measurement axioms, you get these unpleasant superpositions which are the measurement problem. How do you understand from these crazy wave functions, which are superpositions of different macroscopic situations, what, is that, what, what do you understand that that's telling you about the world? That's the problem. You, have to, you would like what quantum theory should explain are certain patterns of macroscopic events, the things we see happen. And in particular, it should explain the statistics of results of quantum experiments, pointers pointing this way or that way. And in particular, it, ought, it better be the case that pointers end up sometimes pointing. Whenever you do the experiment, you better get results. Those results are not in the wave function. We're insisting that we can't invoke rules of observation to explain those results. So how do we explain that a pointer ends up pointing? It has to be the case but that the basic variables of the theory are such that they will correspond when, there are, when the variables have appropriate values to pointers pointing and things like that. Now, the basic variables should um, be presumably variables on the, describing the microscopic scale, because big things like pointers are made out of small things, things on the more fundamental level, the microscopic level. So there should be variables on the fundamental level, on a microscopic level, which when they're arranged in a certain way, the, uh, these constituents form objects like pointers which suitably point. That leads to the need for local beables, structures in space-time, local structures which can be arranged so that we have tables, chairs, and pointers, and all the rest. Here is a statement of Bell about local beables. This was used before. What are they? These are the mathematical counterparts in the theory to real events at definite places and times in the real world as distinct from the many purely mathematical constructions that occur in the working out of physical theories, as distinct from things which may be real but not localized, like the wave function, as distinct from the observables of other formulations of quantum mechanics for which we have no use here. You, I don't know whether you detect any edge in what Bell says in this last part when he refers to observables, but I think there's an edge there, and I'll come back to that very soon. The two-slit experiment. Well, if you 
demand that your theory have local beables, which are supposed to explain results of quantum measurements and everything else we see around us, and you don't have a lot of imagination, you are immediately led, I would say, to Bohmian mechanics. How do you get to Bohmian mechanics from the usual theory? You let yourself be just follow the language. In standard quantum mechanics, you talk about particles. If you're not, imag not imaginative, you'll say particles means particles, things with positions. So you'll say that in addition to the wave functions, you have particles, things with positions, so that the complete description of the system will involve its wave function together with the positions of its particles. So the crucial idea of Bohmian mechanics is utterly trivial. Particles means particles. That's an idea, it's not a theory. To have a theory, you need evolution equations. You have one for the wave function, Schrodinger's equation. And as soon as you look for an equation for the particles, you can ask for what's the simplest kind of evolution equation you could have for the particles. Almost any way you think about it, and there are by at least 10 different routes, you're led to the same equation which you've seen many times, actually written in at least three different ways here. And so then you get to um, Bohmian mechanics, out of which, uh, concerning which I want to say right now very little more. I simply want to give a nice bell quote, which has it, I don't think it's been used here, uh, about um, the, the two-slit experiment. In the quote, Bell is referring to this, the pattern of trajectories that you get in the two-slit experiment for Bohmian mechanics. All of you have seen it. Some, maybe some of you have just seen it for the first time here. I doubt it. I think you've all seen it before. Here's what Bell says. Is it not clear from the smallness of the scintillation on the screen that we have to do with the particle? So what's happening here? In the, when you do the experiment, you, particles arrive one at a time, if you do it at low intensity, one at a time at a screen, and a dot appears. So first you have a dot somewhere, then a dot somewhere else, then a dot somewhere else, you get a pattern. The pattern of dots corresponds very well to the pattern of trajectories you see here. Is it not clear from the smallness of the scintillation on the screen that we have to do with a particle? And is it not clear from the diffraction and interference patterns that the motion of the particle is directed by a wave? De Broly showed in detail how the motion of a particle passing through just one of two holes in the screen could be influenced by waves propagating through both holes and so influenced that the particle does not go where the waves cancel out but is attracted to where they cooperate. This idea seems to me so natural and simple to resolve the wave particle dilemma, dilemma in such a clear and ordinary way that it is a great mystery to me that it was so generally ignored. And it should be a mystery. You have answered why, why it's generally ignored. Well, go ahead. Next. Um, <laughs> naive realism about operators. Um, what is that? You heard about it um, before from Damiano and uh, um, Andrea. Um, that's actually a real problem, naive realism about operators. It, it infects, it infects is probably not a strong enough word, so much thinking about foundations of quantum mechanics if when you hear people say that in quantum mechanics we need a new logic, it's because of naive realism about operators. When you hear people say that to understand quantum mechanics you have to, you have to, you have to use a non-Kolmogorovian probability, that's because of naive realism about operators. Almost all the weird stuff people say, not non-locality, but all the other weird stuff, is because of naive realism about operators. What is naive realism about operators? It means taking the language in quantum mechanics about op operators as observables too seriously. To think that if you have, a, that, ever, that a self adjoint operator, that the self, what, what is the language we use in quantum mechanics? We are told at square one that the observables in quantum theory are operators. 
Self-adjoint operators, and people are often very happy because it sounds very deep. Now we know what the, oper what the observables are. Now we know what the physical quantities are. Isn't it great that we have some precise mathematics which picks out for us what the physical quantities are? The problem with it is that these are not physical quantities at all. Are, at all. These are just objects which are useful for the description of certain, of, of many, many experiments. Yet, one of the common objections to Bohm is that, OK, you can handle positions, but what about all the other observables? Don't you need to make real in the same way that you made position real by assuming that the position has a value at every instant? That's what the theory says. You have particles with positions. Shouldn't every other quantum observable, every self adjoint operator, have a value at every time? This really appeals strongly to students of quantum mechanics, and it is complete foolishness. If you wanted to, you could actually write down some equation. You could, all, you could add extra variables corresponding to all the other operators and even give them a dynamics. And all you would have served to do is complicate the theory. It would have been utterly pointless to have done so. Here's some bell on it. So first, it was a fragment of what I uh, quoted before, ex sort of ex conveying a bit of an edge in Bell's a bit of an edge when he refers to observables. The observables of other formulations of quantum mechanics for which we have no use here. Final moral concerns terminology. Why did such serious people take so seriously axioms which now seem so arbitrary? He's referring here to the measurement axioms. The axioms about measuring all the observables. I suspect that they were misled by the pernicious misuse of the word measurement in contemporary theory. And I, you could also say pernicious misuse of the word observable, because these words go together. Measure, you measure observables. Measure, if measurement is being misused, so is observable. The ver this word very strongly suggests the ascertaining of some pre-existing property of something, any instrument involved playing a purely passive role. Quantum experiments are just not like that, as we learned especially from Bohr. The results have to be regarded as the joint product of system and apparatus, the complete experimental setup. But the misuse of the word measurement makes it easy to forget this and then to expect that the results of measurements, in quote, because they are not really measurements, should obey some simple logic in which the apparatus is not mentioned. The resulting difficulties soon show that any such logic is not ordinary logic. It is my impression that the whole vast subject of quantum logic has arisen in this way from the misuse of a word. For Bell, the word measurement, but also the word observable. I am convinced that the word measurement has now been so abused that the field would be significantly advanced by banning its use altogether in favor, for example, of the word <laughs> experiment. I really feel that if every person working in foundations of quantum mechanics took, took this to heart, the field would be enormously improved. In physics, the only observations we must consider are position observations, if only the positions of instrument pointers. Bell is not saying that the only things we can measure are positions. He's talking about the fact that at the end of the day, when you finish the measurement, you're going to have something positional, like a pointer pointing, which registers the result. It is a great merit of the de Broglie bone picture to force us to consider this fact. If you make axioms rather than definitions and theorems about the measurement of anything else, like the other observables, like you do in orthodox quantum theory, then you commit redundancy and risk inconsistency. Students, how many of you understand this statement? Raise your hands. How many of you don't understand this statement? Please, raise your hand. How many of you don't know whether you understand this statement? <laughs> oh, you guys are scared. Look. My, I don't think you all understand this statement, and my point here is to suggest to you very, very strongly, think about it until you really do understand it, because then you will really understand something important. I 
think I want to skip most of them. Well, there's plenty of time. They, that x rather than psi. So x refers to, let's say, this is probably referring to Bohmian mechanics, but I'm not even 100% sure I think it is. X is also, x is the positions of one or more particles. That x rather than psi is historically called a hidden variable. Okay, so this is related to the red and hidden. That x rather than psi is historically called a hidden variable is a piece of historical silliness. From the microscopic variables x, little x, x now, so the x here was, I guess, macroscopic. Little x, microscopic. From the microscopic variables, little x can be constructed macroscopic variables, capital X. So capital X is some function of the little x's, the positions of all the particles, say. Including in particular, so the macroscopic variables could be, including in particular instrument readings, image density on photographic plates, plates, ink density on a computer output, and so on, of course. There is some ambiguity in defining such quantities. For example, over precisely what volume should the discrete particle density be averaged to define the smooth macroscopic density? However, it is the merit of the theory that the ambiguity is not in the foundation, but only at the level of identifying objects of particular interest to macroscopic observers. And the ambiguity arises simply from the grossness of these creatures. It is thus from the x's, the microscopic variables, rather than from psi, that in this theory we suppose, quote, observables to be constructed. It is in terms of the x's that we would define a psychophysical parallelism if we were pressed to go so far. Thus, it would be appropriate to refer to the x's as exposed variables and psi as a hidden variable. It is ironic that the, the traditional terminology is the reverse of this. There's something, you might have found something a bit weird here. Why all of a sudden, out of the blue, a reference to psychophysical parallelism. Now, Bell wasn't crazy, and he was a good writer. There was a reason for it. I'll come to it a little bit, touch on it. But I do want you to notice that somewhat strange allusion there. Should seem strange to you. All right. Mind. Bell did have some things to, this is kind of peripheral, but Bell did think and worry about mind. I know you don't, you don't, I don't like it, good. This is, this is definitely one of the things which, though I is, do think it's important to understand, I have to say I don't insist that you understand it because I, I suspect that many of you, if you think really, really hard about it for many, many, many hours, you'll still have trouble. I must say in my own case, it took me years and years and years to come to arrive at a decent understanding of the, what the problem is. So don't worry too much about it. But to do justice to Bell, I do want to say a bit about what he said. This quote you've seen several times. My emphasis here on the quote is a bit different from the previous ones. A piece of matter then is a galaxy of such events. Remember that with the flashes? As a schematic psychophysical parallelism, there it is again. After the flashes, we suddenly have this crazy business about psychophysical parallelism. And I'm sorry, I shouldn't say craziness because Bell was not being crazy. As a schematic psychophysical parallelism, we can suppose that our personal experience is more or less directly of events in particular pieces of matter, our brains, which, are, which events are in turn correlated with events in our bodies as a whole, and they in turn with events in the outer world. I don't think I alleviated any mystery there. That's just indicating to you that on more than one occasion, Bell has, here he goes at even greater length about the situation. So what the hell is, you might wonder, what's going on with Bell here? Here he makes a statement about mind. I uh, forgot where this, where is this from? I don't know. As regards mind, consciousness, I am fully convinced that it has a central place in the ult ultimate nature of reality. But I am very doubtful that contemporary physics has reached so deeply down that that idea will soon be professionally fruitful. For our generation, I think we can more profit profitably seek Bohr's necessary classical terms, in quotes, 
in ordinary macroscopic objects rather than in the, in the mind of the observer. So if we want to explain experience, we shouldn't understand experience in terms of mind or consciousness, conscious events, but in terms of patterns in macroscopic observables, the things we see. Not directly explaining literally the seeing, but what we speak of as seeing, patterns in the world, tables, chairs, pointers. Typicality. Bell had some of the best and most succinct statements about how crucial typicality is for understanding quantum mechanics. Um, and I've, it seems that Bell's thinking on this subject has been sort of, for many people, just sailed under the radar. So I want to give some quotes about Bell on typicality. Then, for instantaneous macroscopic configurations, the pilot wave theory, Bohmian mechanics, gives the same distribution, probability distribution, as the orthodox theory, insofar as the latter is unambiguous. However, this question arises. What is the good of either theory, giving distributions over a hypothetical ensemble of worlds when we have only one world? He goes on. A single configuration of the world will show Statistical distributions over its different parts. Suppose, for example, this world contains, this one world contains an actual ensemble of similar experimental setups. It follows from the theory, and I guess I think he's, he's talking here about Bohmian mechanics. It follows from the theory that the typical world will approximately realize quantum mechanical distrib distributions over such approximately independent components. The role of the hypothetical ensemble is precisely to, given by psi squared, I should add, the role of the hypothetical ensemble is precisely to permit definition of the word typical. Another bell. This refers to Everett. Then there is the surprising contention of Everett and DeWitt, it's many worlds, that the theory yields its own interpretation. The hard core of this seems to be the assertion that the probability interpretation emerges without being assumed. Insofar as this is true, it is true also in the pilot wave theory. In that theory, our unique world is supposed to evolve in deterministic fashion from some definite initial state. However, to identify which features are details crucially dependent on the initial conditions, like whether the first scattering is up or down in an alpha track, and which features are more general, like the distribution of scattering angles over the track as a whole, it seems necessary to envision, envisage a comparison class. This class, we took to be a hypothetical ensemble of initial configurations with distribution psi squared. In the same way, Everett has to attach weights to the different branches of his multiple universe, and in, say, and in the same way does so in proportion to the norms of the relevant parts of the wave function. Everett and DeWitt seem to regard this choice as inevitable. I am unable to see why. Although, of course, it is a perfectly reasonable choice with several nice properties. Okay, part, end of part one. I think there's time for part two. 20 minutes, plenty of time. Bye, guys. Everybody can leave now. <laughs> now, um, two people here have heard this already, Tim and Vishnia. This, come, this is about, I think, this is, this, is, this is something I gave about 20 years ago at a Bell Memorial Conference, but I think it's appropriate here. And I, Siri, I can't, no, nobody else here could have been there. You were not there. Tim and, and, and of, of course, you remember this. Bell on Bohm. 
I began this with, um, and I'm just basically going to read. I began with a preamble for an audience of people, of non-scientists, non-physicists, very broad public audience. I guess I can skip all of that because you don't need the background. You don't need the preamble. So I skipped that, and um, maybe I'll come, maybe I will read this. Now, Bell wrote much and lectured much about his theorem and its implications. But he wrote and lectured as much, if not more, concerning the virtues of what is the most famous of all hidden variable theories, that of David Bohm. The question thus naturally arises, why did, Bohm spend so much, why did Bell spend so much time and effort expounding upon a theory of just the sort that he, had, that he himself had shown to be, if not impossible, unworthy of consideration? This was the common view that Bell had shown that. Indeed, some physicists have spoken of two Bells and have suggested that Bell must have been schizophrenic. I, I was intended not to read that, because of, but because of Federico's talk, I wanted to re reiterate this idea of the two Bells. What was the title of it, Federico's talk? Twin Bells? Twin bell, yeah. I wish to argue that there was, on, that there was the Bell twins. I wish to argue that there was Unfortunately for us, but one bell, and he was the sanest and most rational of men. There is something else that I'd like to do. I would like to convey a small sense of Bell's wonderful style, wit, and clarity. So, to the extent possible, I shall allow Bell to speak for himself. I shall read excerpts from Bell's articles on the foundations of quantum mechanics, which pertain to our question. These articles are all collected in his marvelous book, Speakable and Unspeakable in Quantum Mechanics. Well, I, I would urge all of you and indeed anyone with an interest in physics to read this book and then read it again. I shall also have occasion to read from an interview Bell gave many, many years ago now to the philosopher Rene Weber. Now, the code here is, um, what's the, the blue is Bell. The black is me. When I was a student, I had much difficulty with quantum mechanics. It was comforting to find that even Einstein had had some such difficulties for a long time. Indeed, they had led him to the heretical conclusion that something was missing in the theory. Here's Einstein. I am, in fact, rather firmly convinced that the essentially statistical character of contemporary quantum theory is solely to be ascribed to the fact that this theory operates with an incomplete description of physical systems. That's Einstein. Einstein is expressing here the conviction that the supposedly novel quantum randomness will ultimately turn out to be of the same character as the familiar, normal, down-to-earth, randomness exhibited, for example, in the behavior of a roulette wheel or a coin flip. The behavior appears random because there are too many relevant details to keep track of. If the quantum description could be completed by the incorporation of such details, the result would be called a hidden variable theory. However, soon after the advent of, advent of quantum theory, any hidden variable account of quantum phenomena was mathematically, quote, proven to be impossible. Bell continues. Einstein did not seem to know that this possibility of peaceful coexistence between quantum statistical predictions and a more complete theoretical description had been disposed of with great rigor by J. von Neumann. I myself did not know of von Neumann's demonstration at first hand, for at that time it was available only in German, which I could not read. However, I knew of it from the beautiful book by Born, Natural Philosophy of Cause and Chance, which was in fact one of the highlights of my physics education. Discussing how things might develop, Born wrote, I expect that we shall have to sacrifice some current ideas and to use still more abstract methods. However, these are only opinions. A more concrete contribution to this question has been made by J.V. J. V. Neumann in his brilliant book, Mathematische Grund Grundlagen der Quantenmechanik. The result is that no concealed parameters can be introduced with the help of which the indeterministic description could be transformed into a deterministic one. 
Hence, if a future theory should be deterministic, it cannot be a modification of the present one, but must be essentially different. By that he means it presumably must make different predictions. How this could be possible without sacrificing a whole treasure of well-established results, I leave to the determinist to worry about. Having read this, Bell says, I relegated the question to the back of my mind and got on with more practical things. Bell continues, but in 1952, I saw the impossible done. It was in papers by David Bohm. Bohm showed explicitly how parameters could indeed be introduced into non-relativistic wave mechanics with the help of which the indeterministic description could be transformed into a deterministic one. More importantly, in my opinion, the subjectivity of the orthodox version, the necessary reference to the observer could be eliminated. Moreover, the essential idea was one that had been advanced already by de Broglie in 1927 in his pilot wave picture. Let me briefly indicate, try to indicate, the sort of thing Bell had in mind when objecting to the subjectivity of orthodox quantum theory by means of a perhaps extreme example. Concerning the implications of quantum theory, in fact of Bell's theorem itself, about which more later, a very distinguished physicist once wrote that, quote, the moon is demonstrably not there when nobody looks. Who knows who said that? Oh, Roddy raised his hand. So you're always with the students, Roddy. <laughs> Merman, that's N. David Merman. Um, The same thing? Yeah, about the moon, yes, yes. The moon is, but they must have been, maybe they were quoting Merman. I'm, I'm, all, I'm certain it was. No, no, it was Merman. That's right, the question. But this statement about Bell. Yeah, yeah. The moon is demonstrably. This is, Bell's theorem has told us that the moon is demonstrably not there when nobody looks. It's been demonstrated. More Bell. Bohm's 1952 papers on quantum mechanics were, for me, a revelation. The elimination of indeterminism was very striking, but more important, it seemed to me, was the elimination of any need for a vague division of the world into system on the one hand and apparatus or observer on the other. I have always felt since that people who have not grasped the ideas of those papers, and unfortunately they remain the majority, are handicapped in any discussion of the meaning of quantum mechanics. Here's from the interview with Rene Weber. In my, picture, in my opinion, the picture which Bohm proposed then completely disposes of all the arguments you will find among the great founding fathers of the subject that in some way quantum mechanics was a new departure of human thought which necessitated the introduction of the observer, which necessitated speculation about the role of consciousness and so on. All those are simply refuted by Bohm's 1952 theory. In that theory, you have a scheme of equations which completely reproduces all the experimental predictions of quantum mechanics, and it simply does not need an observer. So I think that it is somewhat scandalous that this theory is so largely ignored in textbooks and is simply ignored by most physicists. They don't know about it. So what does Bohm add to the standard quantum descriptions? You all know. In a word, the particles and cells. For Bohm, the so-called hidden variables are simply the positions of the particles of the quantum system, say the electrons of an atom. These particles move in a manner which is naturally choreographed by the wave function of the system. From the perspective of Bohm's theory, orthodox quantum theory, orthodox quantum mechanics leaves out the guts of the description the very particles which combine to form everything we see around us. Thus, as applied to Bohm's theory, the terminology hidden variables seems rather inappropriate, suggesting as it does something exotic, artificial, and ad hoc. Here's Bell. Absurdly, such theories are known as hidden variable theories. Absurdly, for there, in these theories, it is not in the wave function that one finds an image of the visible world and the results of experiments, but in the complementary hidden quotes and an exclamation point, variables. 
Of course, the extra variables are not confined to the visible macroscopic scale, for no sharp definition of such a scale could be made. The microscopic aspect of the complementary variables is indeed hidden from us. Here Bell refers to the fact that in Bohm's theory, the detailed trajectories of the microscopic particles are not observable. While this un unobservability is a consequence of the very structure of the theory, many physicists quickly objected. After all, physics is about prediction, about observation, not about things which cannot be observed, so they say, so that many would say. Here's Bell. But to admit things not visible to the gross creatures that we are is, in my opinion, to show a decent humility and not just a lamentable addiction to metaphysics. The very existence of Bohm's theory, agreeing as, agreeing as it did in its predictions with those of orthodox quantum theory, quite naturally under the circumstances, raised many questions for Bell. Bell, but why then had Born not told me of this pilot wave, if only to point out what was wrong with it? Why did von Neumann not consider it? More extraordinarily, why did people go on producing impossibility proofs after 1952? when Bohm's theory was published, and as recently as 1978, when even Pauli, Rosenfeld, and Heisenberg could produce no more devastating criticism of Bohm's version than to brand it as metaphysical and ideological. Why is the pilot wave picture ignored in textbooks? Should it not be taught, not as the only way, but as an antidote to the prevailing complacency, to show us that vagueness Subjectivity and indeterminism are not forced on us by experimental facts, but by deliberate theoretical choice. Of course, the most immediate question raised was, or should have been, what went wrong with the proof? All of the impossibility proofs, von Neumann's in particular. The realis and I won't read this again because I read it at the beginning, the realization about the limited, the re limited relevance of von Neumann's proof. Let's skip that. Well, Bell analyzed von Neumann's proof as well as other proofs, found that they were based upon rather arbitrary assumptions or axioms, and focused on the manner in which Bohm's theory violated these assumptions. And he, in so doing, he noticed that what I read before, there's an explicit causal mechanism. His investigation of that led to, his, led to Bell's inequality. No sooner said than done. No sooner did he raise the question of whether he could do better and rule, and rule out and find a, an impossibility proofs for at least local hidden variables. He did it and he got more than he bargained for. No sooner said than done. In fact, if we follow the publication's date, done before said, the EPR Bell's theorem paper, 1964, in which it was done, appeared almost two years before the paper from which I was just quoting about, which led to this. There was publication delay. Bell interview. As a professional theoretical physicist, I like the Bohm theory because it is sharp mathematics. I have there a model of the world in which sharp mathematical terms, in sharp mathematical terms, that has this non-local feature. So when I first realized that, I asked, is that inevitable, or could somebody smarter than Bohm have done it differently and avoided this non-locality? That is the problem that the theorem is addressed to. The theorem says, no, even if you are smarter than Bohm, you will not get rid of non-locality. That any sharp mathematical formulation of what is going on will have that non-locality. Moreover, the non-locality of Bohm's theory derives solely from the non-locality built into the structure of standard quantum theory as provided by a wave function on configuration space, an abstraction which, roughly speaking, combines or binds distant particles into a single irreducible reality. Here's Bell. That the guiding wave, in the general case, propagates not an ordinary three space, but in a multi-dimensional configuration space, is the origin of the, no, of the notorious non-locality of quantum mechanics. It is, an emer is a, it is a merit of the de Broglie-Bohm version to bring this out so explicitly that it cannot be ignored. Now the relevant experiments have been done, confirming the strange predictions to which Bell was led by his analysis of Bohm's theory. Where does this le now leave us? There's a basic problem. Bohm's theory violates Lorentz invariance, a central principle of physics. 
nor can Bohm's theory be easily modified so that it becomes Lorentz invariant. The difficulty here arises from the fundamental tension, the apparent incompatibility between non-locality and Lorentz invariance. Bell interview. Now what is wrong with this theory, with David's theory? What is wrong with this theory is that it is not Lorentz invariant. That's a very technical thing. And most philosophers don't bother with Lorentz invariance. And in elementary quantum mechanics books, the paradoxes that are presented have nothing to do with Lorentz invariance. Those paradoxes are simply disposed of by the 1952 theory of Bohm, leaving as the question the question of Lorentz invariance. So one of my missions in life is to get people to see that if they want to talk about the problems of quantum mechanics, the real problems of quantum mechanics, they must be talking about Lorentz invariance. And from the last sentence of, to my knowledge, Bell's last publication, the last word, as it were, referring to Bohm's theory and to GRW theory, which you've heard about, a modification of quantum theory in which he became interested in his last years, Bell said, the big question in my opinion is, which, if either of these two precise pictures, can be redeveloped in a Lorentz invariant way? I believe that this really is the big question, and I urge it upon you. But I am afraid that in trying to answer this question, we shall miss Bell's help and inspiration very much indeed. And we shall miss Bell's marvelous style, his penetrating wit, and his brilliant clarity. Thank you. Thank you.